All right, thanks everyone for coming today. My name is Catherine Foreman Gray, and I'm a history and preservation officer in the community and cultural outreach department. There's an echo going on, it's kind of throwing me off. <laughs> um, I'm excited today that we have Lisa Rutherford here who's going to talk about Southeast textiles and also trade era uh, Cherokee clothing. I've known Lisa for quite a few years and she is definitely an expert in this field and she's done a lot of research on it. Um, I do want to say before we get started that uh, we are going to start having these lunch and learns the third Thursday um, of each month at noon, not 1230 like today, but at noon. Um, hopefully we don't have any more problems like we did today. So, And next month we will have David Fowler who is going to talk about Cherokee women in the American Civil War. So I'm excited to have him here um, to present on that. I'll go ahead and get started with Lisa. I'm going to give a brief introduction and then let her take over from here. Uh, Cherokee citizen Lisa Rutherford lives on a cattle ranch in Cherokee County and previously worked for Cherokee Nation and Tribal Administration for many years before becoming a full-time artist. Lisa's passion is 18th century art and history and she has been a living history interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, the National Museum of the American Indian, and other venues throughout the Southeast United States. Lisa is a seasonal interpre interpreter at the Delagua Village at the Cherokee Heritage Center. Active in many art forms, Lisa has been a potter since 2005 and is perhaps best known for her pottery, specializing in ancestral pottery with hand Lisa other capes, which were described by her, worn by Cherokee women in the mid 80s on a hand tied plant fiber net. Clothing, moccasins, does southeast applique beadwork, and is a novice painter. Lisa's work is in the collections of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian Art and the Fred Jones Jr. Museum at the University of Oklahoma. Everyone, welcome Lisa Rutherford. Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. And I'm sorry, I want to talk about the early text, about the differences in living history, costuming. I'm dressed today in my, and uh, this is what I would wool leggings and skirt and a silk ribbon. And uh, this Stroud wool is a type that you can't get any dollars a meter, which is 38 inches the last time I was able to purchase any. So uh, this is a type that would have been heavily traded in the uh, late 1600s, early 1700s. But I'll get started here with the textiles. This is your basic trade shirt. And these were sent over from England uh, during the height of the deerskin trade. They were shipping those over by the bale. And they were mostly white linen. Uh, you can see the different parts of the shirt. There's a reinforcement that goes over the shoulder. And I always thought those were not really necessary, as well as the little reinforcements here and then the vents on the side, which I don't have. Until I started working in Diligua and uh, sewing up these shirts that are worn every day. And then you can see that every feature on this shirt has a function and um, I you know I try to take a few shortcuts at first and it doesn't pay off so yeah that little extra time to reinforce it or put in an extra gusset that really makes your shirts last longer now uh, you might recognize these guys we've got Tommy Wildcat Noel Grayson and Joseph Knight and they're all wearing trade shirts um, I think this was taken at the Heritage Center but they were usually white until about 1750s, and then they started uh, bringing in the checked linen. It was a blue checked was most popular, but it's not a plaid. It's like a, a window pane check. And we also were getting some stripes and other colors in. But not only were we getting trade shirts, we were starting to trade for linen, and there were a lot of native made shirts as well. And there's a couple of paintings and uh, sketches that show early southeast males wearing what looks like the chemise that the women wore. Here it looks, it has a drawstring neckline and drawstrings around the arms and it has the underarm gusset. But the European women wore these as uh, basically as underwear or a nightgown and they didn't, sometimes didn't bathe as often as the, the natives did and they wanted to protect their fine gowns and their expensive clothing, their outerwear to keep them and they were white so you could bleach them but there are similar looking garments pan and it looks like the neckline like this shirt so I don't know if they had acquired an English shift and maybe cut it or if this was a native made shirt so that's one of the things I've been most recently researching and you can't 
Well, I have the outline. Whoops. Okay, this is a basic wrap skirt made of wool, and I have bound the edges with ribbon. Uh, it's just wrapped around uh, this one. I think it goes to here. Now, I like to fold my tops down and make a drawstring. So I just wrap it around and then tie it on the side. And then on this string, you can bring the ties from your leggings up, and you can tie them to your belt. And that works pretty well. Other people, I think Catherine used to have a hook and eye on hers. Some people put buttons on them. But historically, they just put a, a we had leather belts at that time. You would just buckle a belt around, and you could fold the top of the skirt over. And that's kind of bulky, especially with this heavy stroud wool. So I kind of like the drawstring better. Then the other type of skirt women were wearing in the 1700s, perhaps a little bit later than the 1710, was the petticoat. Now, we think of a petticoat as a slip, but it is a linen skirt, and it has, you can see, this is Betty Frog, made herself, and we're at Colonial Williamsburg demonstrating then. We were representing the 1777 Cherokee delegation, along with some Eastern Band members, and this was the first time the Cherokee Nation and the United Ketua Band and had all three tribes been there at Williamsburg. So uh, Betty did a great job. I think that was her first one she made. But in the cold weather, you would layer these petticoats. Now these were our camp hosts, hostesses at Williamsburg. And uh, they are portraying Cherokee women. They're actually both uh, Lakota. And uh, Felicity in the blue, uh, this is called a short jacket or a bed gown. And usually they were made to hang open, but you could pin them shut as she has. And you can see she's wearing one of the ruffled shirts, which those were worn mostly by the headmen or uh, for dress up occasions. And we don't really have any record of women wearing them. But um, there was a long story involved in how Felicity ended up in that shirt. so. Uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. But notice, too, she's wearing ribbons tied to her earrings, silk ribbons. Uh, we like to decorate our clothing with ribbon and, and a lot of the trade silver. And Ariel, the one on the right, is also Lakota. Um, you can see they're wearing a little bit different. She's got a different jacket on here. And Ariel's just wearing their trade shirt. Now the men wore the trade shirts. Women and men alike wore the same style trade shirts. So you see women who do living history, their shirts are going to be baggy. They're going to fit like a man's shirt would have fit a woman because that's what they were. But uh, the men wore the breech clout or breech cloth and leggings. That was their basic wear. The breech clout, uh, you belt it around the waist and the flaps hang over the front and the back. And the leggings are made of wool, and they're supposed to fit very tight, almost like, uh, almost like socks or uh, the type of stretchy leggings that women wear today. That's how tight they're supposed to fit. Now I have mine a little bit looser because I'm working out in the village in the rain and the weather, and I'm not going to ruin all my moccasins out there. So I wear boots sometimes, and I need the leggings to fit over them. But the historic ones were very tight. And they had the side flap for uh, three to four inches was common, but a lot of people don't like that extra fabric. But that was historically how they were worn. Now today, I like to cut mine about two inches. They just get in the way. Center seam leggings, they weren't seen until the very late 1700s and in the beginning uh, after 1800. So this is a breech cloth and leggings that I made for Zach out in the village and of course his Steelers medallion is not quite accurate. He sneaked that one by. But um, yeah, this is just one of the ways today that people are still wearing this type of clothing. I dress this way every, every day. The match coat was another item of clothing that was very important. Men were never caught without a match coat, summer or winter, and a, a match coat is simply a, a Stroud wool, two meters of stroud, and it's decorated with silk ribbon. Now, the one on the dress stand here with the trade shirt, that's a more modern version. That's satin ribbon, and I made that for a display. 
the other one is from Colonial Williamsburg and it has silk ribbon on it and a little bit of the beadwork trim. You can see the simple beadwork. That's a style that was also used on maybe the bottoms of the skirts and your leggings as well. But uh, the cost of that silk ribbon is going to be about $4 a yard as opposed to about, what, 50 cents per yard for the satin. It's shared a lot of, we're running back and forth sharing in clothing for Dealey Gloss. And uh, this is, I wanted to show you these pictures because of this trim. That is called bed lace. And that's an archaic term, and I don't know what they call it now. I've heard you could still find it. I've never been able to find any, but if you had a match coat with uh, several rows of bed lace, well, then you had some status or you had uh, accomplished Mr. One of the on the right, uh, he's Eastern man, I think Michael, in this instant, the key. And he copied that face pigmentation and somewhere I've seen a picture of him holding the actual, remember which uh, thing, but he did copy that uh, face paint. And women wore a little bit of the red paint, but we most forehead, and I think wearing it in the part of your hair helps to keep you from getting sunburned. The women didn't wear a lot of the paint. The red ochre powder is what they used. Okay, for footwear, we wore moccasins, center seam, pucker toed, and those are my, um, probably the oldest pair of moccasins I have. And um, they have little, I've got little bells on them. We did embellish them with the small trade bells. But most of the, the references I found about moccasins talk about them wearing them with the flaps up. You fold them up and tie them around. Well, again, wearing them every day in the village, I learned that you're going to get a lot of sticks and dirt and rocks and things in your moccasins. So tying up those flaps really helps to keep the things out. And here are some different types. Uh, those are mine on the upper left. Uh, they've got a little bit of beadwork and some trade silver on them. And the dyed deer hair uh, with the cones and the bells, those are all uh, documented. Now the wool on the flaps was closer to 1800s. Uh, that we didn't really do that in the early 1700s, but we did put the ribbon or, ribbon or strips of wool around the edges of the flaps with a little bit of beadwork. The other pair is uh, a very, at one time, very nice pair of Eden moccasins, and those are in the collection of NMAI, and they're later, they're after 1800, but they have the arched cuff on them. They don't have flats, and you don't see that style very often. I've been wanting to make myself a pair, but um, they, we had a few pair, I think, when we had the beadwork exhibit at the Heritage Center. We had a couple pair. I, we might have had that very pair in there. But we did have some of those arched cuffs. And these are other examples. Um, in 2014, I did a research fellowship at the National Museum of the American Indian. And I spent 10 days in D.C. And I was able to go in. My uh, topic was textiles. And before I went, I had to tell them what I wanted to see. So uh, basically, I asked to see every item of Cherokee clothing you have. And I wanted to see their feather capes because they have some from spiral mounds, which are not Cherokee, but they're, uh, since we have so very, very few examples of textiles that survive, and they are in this area, uh, I did want to research those as well. But I think the ones with the soles, the top ones, are after 1800, and those were Eastern band moccasins. Um, those look like brain tan on the upper right. I'm not sure about the others. And these were baby moccasins. You can see they have the little slits where they had put ties around them. Okay, and these are just some of the ways. That's the basic clothes we wore, and this is some of the different ways we're wearing it today. And again, this is at Williamsburg. Um, Betty wearing her linen outfit. It rained the whole time we were there, so they kept telling us we were such good sports and did such a good job talking to people, and Betty and I were laughing because we do this every day at Dela I've been giving tours in the rain for three weeks at this point, so this was just another day at work. And in the other picture, you can see uh, we have a couple of the Eastern Cherokees and Buck Woodard, who is, um, I don't remember his title, uh, but he coordinated this event. He's over the Native American Initiative at Williamsburg. So this is how the colonial men were dressing at that time.
and it looks like I think that's Ariel back there. It looks like she's got a really nice match coat on with a lot of the different ribbons. But this is a, a different event at Williamsburg, and Felicity is portraying a palm monkey woman. Um, she's dressed for the cold. I think she's selling pottery, but you can see she has on several petticoats. You can see she's got her wool leggings on under that and her moccasins. As uh, she's got a few shirts, it looks like a, a short gown over that, and then a blanket and a hat. So the women, um, I, I research not just Cherokee, but other Southeast and other Eastern tribes. And this is how we were incorporating some of the European clothing into our daily wear because uh, it, it's very practical. You know, she could stay very warm dressed like that. And I so want that hat. <laughs> Uh, this is me at Williamsburg um, out with Mr. Purdy's horses that would not pay one bit of attention to me. But uh, I've got on my trade shirt and uh, again the wrap skirt and leggings. <laughs> yeah, here is a different one. Now you see that I'm wearing a sash around my waist. Uh, and the chemise, it was very hot. I was not doing living history at that point. I was just up there. This was a different trip. So we're doing the bear dance, and uh, Justin is my partner there. So um, women did not wear those sashes, or I can find no record of it. That's highly debated, but I've not seen any evidence that women wore them. We like to dress up our men, and they wore the sashes. But I'm kind of vain and I like to have a waist, so sometimes, you know, if I'm just dressing in traditional wear rather than doing living history, I will wear the sash, but it's really pretty hot, so I don't wear one very often. And this is actually, that's part of the same outfit I'm wearing today, but I have my finger woven garters, which matches that sash. But that's a, a good shot of the trade shirt. And this is again uh, what the uh, colonial men were wearing. There's Buck and Betty again, and that same match coat keeps showing up in all my photos. Capes. <laughs> now this is one of the other things. De Soto described those in 1540 among Southeast tribes. He didn't name the tribes. I think he was just more focused on enslaving or, or killing them. But he did describe them, and there are a lot of base, and you can see the netting underneath. Um, that one is goose feathers. I have a few turkey feathers around the top, and that is the one that is in the collection of the National Museum of the American Nations there. They asked to use that photo. I'm thinking about it, I thought, well, I've still got that cape. I should see if they want to buy it. So I sent them the information, and they did. So they, there were very few Cherokee objects, Cherokee clothing objects in that collection, so I was disappointed. But I'm, I'm glad to have one more piece in there. And this one, that's not showing up good, but that's a cape I made for Shan Goshorn. She's an artist from Tulsa, Eastern Band. Her hair, and I really want that too. But uh, of course, trade silver's expensive. But that's a professional photographer as opposed to some of my own photographs, so it really shows it off well. But she doesn't wear this just for her uh, living history. She wears it for dress-up occasions with uh, dresses and you know her more uh, dressy clothing. And she also wears it to powwow. And you, some of you may recognize these two. This was a photo shoot. I provided clothing for cultural tourism. And this is Jamie Miller Jones, or Jamie Ambush Jones. She's a mixed martial arts fighter. And she had a lot of fun with that cape. Um, so there, you'll probably see them in ads for cultural tourism later on. And Bodie Jimerson, and he's wearing it that he's wearing. And my leggings, which are, aren't quite long enough for him, are the clothing, and he's got the copper gorgets. Now, I've also had some of my clothing in more contemporary fashion shows. Uh, this is a collaboration with Orlando Dugai. He's a Navajo designer, and he has taken these feather capes. I make the basic ones on the net, just like the traditional ones, and he adds the jeweled clasp, a beaded collar, linings, sometimes he puts exotic feathers, 
and you know he has a professional models and photographers so he really shows them off well and he's had these capes in a lot of uh, different fashion shows the one on the right was for living arts tulsa's champagne and chocolate fundraiser and they had this fashion show and it was very contemporary if you've ever been to that gallery and they asked for a couple of my outfits so i thought how in the world are they going to fit my very traditional things in with contemporary fashion so i didn't go backstage i just let her the coordinator take the clothing and that's how they came out and if you had seen the rest i should have put some pictures of the rest of the fashion show because they were they had wild makeup uh, one girl had on a skirt that had a framework that came out filled with little champagne flutes that had chocolate in them and she would walk up to you and you could take a piece of chocolate from her dress and she had a, like a Marge Simpson beehive, and she was gorgeous, but uh, yeah, my clothing, uh, I thought it wouldn't fit, but she made it work. And I think people particularly, particularly like the young man, and he is wearing shorts under the breechcloth and leggings, but normally uh, they, the breechcloth is worn with nothing under it. Now this is a, uh, a war chief's cape that I made last year. And I don't think anybody got to see it. I entered it in a competition. I finished in my hotel room Thursday night. Friday at 11, I entered in the competition. They took it away, and I've not seen it since. Uh, they, I won the Idle Tork uh, Museum Purchase Award, so they added that to their collection. And it was whisked away, and I was a little disappointed that nobody got to see it. But it's turkey feathers. Uh, the top, the red goose feathers, red is the color of blood, the color of life, the color of war. And the black around the top represents death and the enemy. So this is my interpretation of what a war chief's cape would have been. And it is also made on the net base, uh, just like the shorter capes. Uh, it doesn't show it off as well with that strange mannequin they've got it tied on, but I wish they had put it on something that had actual shoulders, but uh, that's the only photos I've got of it. And I'm hoping next time I go up there, they'll let me Lisa, how many on. hours did you put on that? Um, I can make the top part in about three weeks. The weaving the net, I, I don't really know. I had, I started it like in February and working on other things during that time and finished in June. But yeah, I've got <coughs> several weeks in that. The feathers, I've trimmed them. They have to be, uh, the quill of them, I trimmed them in half folded them over, lashed them down, and they're all individually sewn on. Now, some people want to string them on the, uh, just string the quills on a thread, but they will pull out that way and they won't hang right. So I like to do mine folded over. Now this, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of my research at NNAI. If, uh, this is the exterior of the museum, if none of you have been there. But I did spend two weeks there and Part of my time was spent in uh, Suitland, Maryland at the Cultural Resource Center and Museum Support Center, which housed the NMAI and the National Museum of the Natu National Museum of Natural History Collections. I always have trouble saying that for some reason. But these are my other participants that were in that program. There were four of us. Uh, Irma and Anita were from South America, from uh, Peru and Chile. And I've always said Irma is the Roy Boney of the Quechuan language because she's working on a lot of the same things Roy has done, uh, translating video games into Quechuan language. Um, she has apps for phones. She's done a lot of uh, language work. <coughs> Anita was a weaver, but I really regretted that neither of them spoke English very well. And I don't speak Spanish, so I couldn't really talk to them even though we had a lot in common. And, we hung out together and we just had a few words that we could communicate with. Jacob Butler was the uh, fourth participant and he is from the Salt River Pima Maricopa community in Arizona. Three time spending 10 days up there and this is when Jacob and Irma had a little bit of trouble with the security on the metro. <laughs> but it all ended well. This is inside the Museum Support Center, the Natural History Museum. Now this was a really creepy place to me to do research. I'm claustrophobic. And it was four floors of this, low ceilings. 
and it's dark, you have to turn on a light for each row you go down. And some of the collection, the items in the collection, especially these feathers, have been treated with poisons way back in the earlier days. Some of them have arsenic and some had mercury. So there were certain drawers. We would open the drawer and they would tell me to stand back. And so we have to leave for about 20 minutes and let this air out. And then you can come back so the fumes won't make you sick. So it was seriously creepy in there at times. This is the outside of the NNAI uh, Cultural Resources Center. And I was impressed that these buildings were all made, I said they were the most Indian friendly buildings I've been in. Um, they made efforts to incorporate nature. Uh, it was a very, um, a lot of native plants. They even had a room after you visited the collections if you needed to smudge. They even had a smudging room in each building where you could go down and depending on what your tribe used, if you used cedar or I think Jacob used ashes one time, but if we visited burial items, you could go smudge to cleanse yourself before you left the building. And they provided all the different materials. So I thought that was really a uh, really nice thing. This is the inside of the Cultural Resources Center and I liked it much better. That's uh, National Museum of the American Indian Center and you can see it's two stories tall. And this little vehicle here, this wave lift, I had to ride on one of those. So I'm up like two stories on that wobbly little thing trying to reach and open a drawer and that's why a lot of my pictures are kind of <laughs> shaky because I, I couldn't lean. I was afraid I would tip over and it was terrifying. <coughs> but they laid out that building uh, of the tribe, so I had to go to the southeast corner of the building to see the Cherokee items. This is such a thrill to see all of these Cherokee objects with my name on the top. And that stands for Artist Leadership Program. So I came in and I got so excited and I just, and I said, I want to see this and this and this. And she said, Lisa, one at a time. Whatever I had at the time and I'm still stealing looks back there at that beadwork and those coats and everything. But this is a bit of, uh, it looks like finger weaving. This came from spiral mounds and a lot of the textiles were rabbit hair that were spun and woven. Some had turkey down in them with uh, vegetal cordage as well. But that's not a very clear picture and it was through plexiglass that that sure looks like a chevron pattern to me. And I, they say that we didn't have that chevron pattern until the late 18th century, but up in the upper right you could kind of see, and it's dyed different colors, that dye has survived. And this is another fragment. You can see where the uh, warp have left the little holes. They have deteriorated, and it may be because they may have been dyed with walnut or something that had uh, is it tannic acid or I can't remember the chemical compound, but it will deteriorate your fibers faster. So a lot of them, we would see the holes of where the fibers had been, but we don't know what type of fiber was there. Now this is a rabbit hair, I think it's a cape. And these were woven, feather designs were woven into there. This is dyed. And it is a burial item if anyone is uncomfortable with that. But I started wondering when I saw it, we have a few, another shot of it. See how those feathers are curved? And they have, some of them have black tips on them. But it reminded me of the shell carvings that I've seen from Spyro. And I thought maybe they're not wearing a feather cape in those shell carvings. Maybe they're wearing a woven one that just has images of feathers on them. So I don't really know. There's a lot, I came away with more questions than answers. This is a fragment of a feather cape from Spyro and they are dyed feathers. Primary feathers used at Spyro were turkey, goose, and a very few swan feathers. But they don't know exactly how uh, the swan feathers were used because in many cases they just found remnants of feathers and that one, of course, still has the, some of the textile with it, but this looks more like the type of feather cape that I make. But we did have some that had the feathers twisted into your cordage and then twined. This is a twined skirt from uh, Clifty Creek, Tennessee. This was in Cherokee country. We don't have a date on that, but that's one of the main things I wanted to see 
because I've been doing the twining. I got started because of the pottery. A lot of your pottery shards will have impressions of the clay um, and impressions of the uh, fibers. And one of the best records of these fibers is the salt pan pottery, which were big shallow dishes where they distilled salt. And since they were so large and shallow, they would make a mold in the ground and line it with their fabric. So they're pressing clay down into it and that gives a very deep, clear impression. So you could tell the direction, if it's a S twist or a Z twist, you could sometimes tell how many plies were in the cordage. Uh, you could see the different patterns. But since very few textiles survive, and I think this is the most complete one known, um, the, the pottery, the salt pan pottery was the best record that we had. And this one, I didn't pick up on it when I saw it. It was not till I saw a reproduction. But here at the bottom, this is not fringe, it is loops. There will be like five concentric loops. And it has a drawstring at the top. It also has those loops on the edge. Now there's a closer look at it. I was allowed to touch these things with gloves on, some of them, but not the really old spiral ones, but they did let me touch this one. Now this is compared, the top is the Clifty Creek skirt. The bottom is one that I had made before I saw the skirt. I just went by photographs of it. So I did this twine skirt and uh, feather cape, which is really made to be worn like that, but I just stuck it on the mannequin. But that hundreds, maybe in the 1500s style. And the twining I have on the bottom right, that's one that we, we dyed those fibers out in Delagua. I think Betty Frog and I, and some of the other women, we used bow dark from the bow makers for the yellow, and then we used walnuts for the brown. <coughs> this is another twine skirt that was found near that Clifty Creek skirt. And I've read reports that young girls wore skirts that were just solid at the top and just fringed. I don't know if that one is unfinished. I could see the weft fibers were about that far from the edge, so it may have been an unfinished skirt or maybe it just unraveled, but I, I did notice those two drawstrings on it. But there was also a piece of river cane found there and the curator, when he showed it to me, he said, we have a, a split cane mat and he pulls it out and I looked at it and I, I said, you have a fish trap. That's not a mat, but uh, all these things were collected out of context. You know, some of them were even collected from, you know, maybe grave robbers. We don't know. So uh, that was the one of the other things that really struck me when I'm talking to my uh, my uh, curator. You know, commenting on these items I'm picking up. I noticed she was writing down everything I said, and they're adding that to the record. They don't change things, but. Uh, you know, if someone comes along and tells them one story about it and then someone else tells them something different, they just add all that to the record. This is one of the rabbit, rabbit hair skirts from Spyro. And I was on a ladder and I was photographing through plexiglass so you could kind of see the fluorescent light fixtures through there, but that was the best pictures I could get. And again, it was all wobbly. But this one was dyed. Uh, I can't tell, some of them had patterns, red skirts with white circles on them. And some had other designs. Running out of time, Greek skirt, and that's Kara Martin. She's an Eastern man, and that was what she wore in the competition, her finest traditional thing, so this was very unusual. And I was really proud of her for wearing that style of clothing because that hadn't been done before. But she didn't win, but still. I wanted to see beadwork. And this bag is one they brought out for me. Uh, they identified it as Cherokee, it was Creek. I'm still the different design elements, the white zigzag, the way the uh, flap is attached. To me, that looks Cherokee. But uh, that's one of those cases where someone came in and thought it looked Creek, so they just added it to the record. So we don't really know. And I don't really trust a lot of the uh, provenance that was with some of these items. And the deerskin coats, these were, um, I've been really anxious to see these. This one, I think, Tony, have you made a replica of this one? Yeah, I think so. 
that's not that one. Um, that's embroidery with a little bit of beadwork on it. So it was a beautiful coat, and I did get to, we would flip them over. We had to put a, a board on top of the little shallow cardboard box it was on, and two of us would flip it and take that box off so I could see the back of it. But the workmanship on the, these coats was just amazing, and I think these were probably around roughly 1800. There's some detail of the embroidery. And my colors are a little distorted uh, because of the lighting in there. This coat, I'd seen this image from the Men at Arms series books. This is from Tahlequah. So that's one reason I wanted to show this to you. I was really excited when I, when I saw that. Uh, it is a beautiful coat. It uh, started out, it, I think, probably as a white or a light color, but it's kind of deteriorated. But it was collected in, in 1908 right here in Tahlequah. There's a back view of it. And one thing I want to point out is we always try to cut out our pattern pieces from one piece of cloth. But look how, you can see how this has been pieced in several places. If they don't have enough, they, they would just piece it. So um, I think right there with the center scene, you can see a little triangle. A lot of them had patches for, you know, they have bullet holes in them sometimes. And, and they just sew them up, sew a little patch and whip stitch it on there. This was probably my favorite, and it was also from Oklahoma. I think I viewed five or six coats, and all but one was uh, from Oklahoma. And I, I looked at this one, and I was just touching it. I was, I was talking to it, and uh, just looking at this coat, and I, I really liked it. And then when I flipped it over, there on the top, you could see there were three eagle feathers sewn right into the middle of the back of that coat. And I, I kind of, I said, oh, I think this is medicine. But it had the red trim. This was a red wool tape. Uh, I can't tell what the design was, but it had deteriorated so badly. And these little horseshoe pieces were on each sleeve. <coughs> and that one had actually come unsewn, and I had to lay it back out for the photograph. But I was really intrigued by this coat. This one was attributed as Cherokee, but it has Seminole patchwork, and it looked like silk patchwork from what I could see. And it was pretty badly deteriorated, but it's still in the style of the uh, coats that the Cherokees and other tribes were wearing. So we don't know if maybe someone, maybe a Cherokee man married a Seminole woman, or maybe they traded, or maybe it was owned by a Cherokee and made by a Seminole. But that was all the provenance we had. And this one had little blue beads into the fringes on it. And it looks like it's laying funny. It's not open right there, but that flap from the pocket hangs over and makes it look like it's not really attached. And then the, this canvas coat, which is a later version, was Eastern Band. But I thought it was interesting that they used the blue lining, but they use the heavy blue thread to sew this together, and their stitches show like they use that thread as a decoration. And these are some moccasins, high top moccasins that were identified as Cherokee. And the, it looks like they've got tassels on the toes, but uh, I don't know, there wasn't a lot of information with them. But we were wearing high top moccasins tied around the ankles at that in the 17, 1800s. This is one of my favorite pairs. This was making the rounds on Facebook a while back. This is groundhog hide. And look how tiny and tight those gathers are. It's gathered all the way up. And it's gathered with the leather thong, not sinew. But that's a very well-made pair of moccasins. And these, I noticed they have little ties on the back that come around under the flaps so they could tie them. And at one time, they probably had wool or ribbon trim around the flaps. But that uh, definitely looks like brain tan. And again, they have those tiny little gathers for the puckers. This pair was identified as Cherokee, but it's Ojibwe style. And I, I took some ideas from this. 
they're gathered, but they have that little strip added in the middle. The, the back of it has two seams. So they're cut uh, with the two seams instead of one up the back. So when my moccasins wore out and I didn't have enough left to stitch it back together, I just borrowed that idea and I cut a little wide strip, stitched it onto my moccasins, tucked it under the toe, and I put soles on mine because I go through them so fast. Flaps hang down, you can't even see it. So that's a great way to fix your worn out moccasins. And this is one of the very few items of Cherokee clothing. Uh, these are Eastern Band, and they're shorts worn in the stickball game, and they had five or six pairs of these. But, um, and also I took a picture of that ball because it's the clamshell style with one seam around the middle. And some of my uh, Diligua Village uh, friends had been debating on whether we actually made them like that, so I kind of settled that question. But... Um, the Museum Support Center, National Museum of American History. And after I visited those, I still had time, and I had an appointment at the National Anthropological Archives, but it's all film and photographs, so when I thought, well, I have the appointment, I might as well go, but I'm sure they're not going to have any photographs of what I'm studying. So I said, pull all the Cherokee photographs you have. Just anything of Cherokees, I want to see what they were wearing at any given time. And this was my favorite photo of three little boys from Big Cove uh, on the Kuala Boundary. And I'm thinking, based on other things that I found around that time, I'm thinking this is probably around uh, maybe 1938, somewhere along there. But I just thought they were so cute, I wanted to include them. And this is something that intrigued me as well. This, it was only a photograph, and it said, the flag of the Ketua Warriors, Friends of the Union. And I, I thought, well, where is this flag today? So here's the <laughs> card that came with it. So apparently it was on loan to the, uh, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they allowed them to photograph it. And they say that it was returned to W.W. Keeler in 1969. So I'm really curious where that flag might be today, and maybe more history about it. But yeah, there's another look at the flag. And it was a black and white photo, so I didn't really get a lot of information. But I thought everyone might be interested in that. And this is a photo I found of Sequoia School. And it says the children cooking and serving the noon meal in their playhouse. The children were divided into family units. Each family had charge of cleaning, cooking, care of the baby, etc., for one week. <laughs> so that's what I, I just found all the local pictures I could find, and I thought I would share that with you. It's kind of odd that they were taking care of a young egg baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is the information um, that's not showing up very well. Uh, if anyone's interested in doing research, uh, you can contact nmai.si.edu. Uh, they have a lot of these items in their collections are online, and you can search uh, to find them. You have to keep searching. You might want to, uh, for example, if you're looking for moccasins, you would uh, search footwear, Cherokee footwear, Southeast footwear, shoes, every term you could think of because you don't know how they've got it entered into that system. I did searches with just the word Cherokee <coughs> to just to see what I could come up with. So you can find a lot of information there. And if you're interested in applying for that uh, art leadership program that I did, uh, I think the applications are usually due in May. But uh, they will uh, host you for 10 days, fly you up there, and pay you a stipend. So are there any questions? I'm not using the banded cloth. I, I have I've recently learned there may be a man that is dyeing the fabric in that ma manner, and it's about $120 a yard now. So I just heard about him, but I haven't purchased anything from him yet. But 
uh, we had a lot of other wools as well, the broadcloth and uh, lighter weight ones from that time period. So I'm, I'm just finding things. Uh, there's a couple of different vendors, um, Burnley and Tropridge in Williamsburg, Virginia, and they have linen, cottons, um, silks, wools, and everything they have is documented. So if you tell them, I want a an accurate, historically accurate outfit from 1762, then they will go show you which fabrics that are documented from that time period. Hey, the feather capes, is that something that like certain people would wear? Was that ceremonial dress? I think they were probably uh, just worn for warmth, uh, from the best I can tell. We've had a ceremonial cape, and Peace Chief would have had a solid white one, one having a cape for ceremonial use. A lot of people think, oh, the beloved woman wore a white cape. I can find if she carried a white swan wing. That doesn't mean she didn't have one, but I, I just can't document it. When you say trade shirt, what do you mean? I mean, is that like an everyday shirt or? Yeah, we, we obtained them through trade is how they got that name. Okay. But yeah, this is the style shirt. The fabric, did they make the shirt and then you just got the fabric? Both. We were, um, they were sending, we were getting ready-made garments for, through trade. They would pack these by the bale and ship them over. But we also got the linen and we're starting to make our own. So we, uh, back in that time in the 1700s, linen was the cheap fabric. That's what your lower class, your working class, and, and slaves would have worn is linen because it was cheaper. And cotton was expensive and that was for the uh, more wealthy people that could afford it. Of course, today if you go into a fabric store, you'll find that's totally opposite. It's kind of a stiff lace, and it almost has like a floral. Uh, Is it like a brocade? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, I wish I could find some. <laughs> but the silk ribbon, I've sewn with silk, and I've sewn a lot with satin, polyester satin ribbon like you could buy at the fabric stores, and there's just no comparison the quality and uh, the ease of working with the silk. And it wears pretty well, because I've been wearing it five or six, seven years, and I'm, I wear authentic. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> Thanks again, Lisa. That was a wonderful and very informative presentation. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate everybody coming. Once again, sorry about the, apologize about the little delay in getting started and hopefully we'll work through that next time but um, for those who might have came in late we will be doing this again uh, February the 18th we'll mention learn is what we're calling them to talk thank you all